Thank you so much for joining us today. Amen. And uh, we want to greet anyone that may be watching this at this particular time. This is a very special. We call these Awaken America. We do them about once a month here in Cleveland, Tennessee, as the Lord permits. And I had a word I wanted to share with you, and I'm so thankful for this building being filled with men and women here that we appreciate so much, and some new friends and many old friends, and I don't say old in age, old in time. So thank you for being here. But I wanted to share with you something about the playbook of the enemy as, he, as it relates to prophetic seasons. Prophetic seasons, my term of what that means is a time period of history in which God changes the entire world or something happens to impact the entire world or prophetic scriptures and words are fulfilled. Many people do not know this, but in the time of, the, of Josephus, the Jewish historian that lived at the destruction of the temple over 1900 years ago, he writes about the history of the Jews and he talks about the book of Genesis and creation. And he alludes to something that most people have never heard. And that is that God gave Adam a prophecy. Adam passed it to Seth and Seth passed it all the way down to Noah. And the prophecy was two parts. That the earth would be destroyed once by the volume of water and a second time by fire. And so that the discoveries would not be lost... They wrote them in brick in one area and they wrote the, the prophecy in stone in another area. And Josephus said that in the land of Syriad, and this was 1900 years ago, that you can see the monument to this day. Some people say that was an area located in Egypt. I'm, I'm uncertain about that, if that's true. But the first major prophetic cycle, or what we call prophetic season, dealt with the seasons of the time of Noah. The second major one dealt with the children of Israel coming out of Egyptian bondage back to the promised land. Not only that, but the third connects with that is when Moses received the revelation of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, because you must understand that from history, God did not have a written word for 2,500 years on the planet. Men only heard the voice of the Lord, saw a vision of God, or saw an angel appear. Then God decided to write what he thought and felt on a parchment that became known as the beginning of the Word of God. That was a monumental prophetic season. Other prophetic seasons will include the time of David, who was promised a kingdom forever. The Messiah came from his lineage. Another prophetic season would be the captivity of the Jews for 70 years in Babylon and their returning later during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah to rebuild Jerusalem and the area of Israel and return to the land. Then we come 400 years of what they call, they call the silent years from Malachi to the time of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, the Bible says it this way, the law and the prophets will up, to, up until John but now it says the kingdom is preached and men are pressing their way into it. So the, the Torah law and the prophets came to John and then a new dispensation, which would call a dispensation of grace that we're, we've been in, originated with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now what we have come to presently is we have come to the season of the signs. Everybody say season of the signs. The seasons of the signs are the Old Testament prophecies and the words of Christ and the apostles and also portions of the book of Revelation. And I'm, I'm putting that in chapter 2 and 3, by the way. The blessings for the overcomer are beginning to emerge in the season that we're now in. Now, if anyone knows the Bible you would be a little bit blind in your mind if you didn't think the Lord's coming before long. Now, someone said, well, I've heard that for years. Yeah, you're going to keep hearing it until it happens, too. I can assure you of that, at least, at least as long as I'm around. Because one of these days in the day and hour that you think not, the Son of Man returns. Now, any time that you have prophetic seasons, and I could go back to the comet that was seen at the time that Noah was building the ark that we now know was probably the same comet called the Hellbop Comet, by the way. 
But we could take you back to the birth of Jesus. We could even take you back to what some of the historians have to say about uh, the Babylonian captivity and show you that cosmic activity in the heavens begins to take place during every major prophetic season. Other things begin to happen. Angel and demonic battles, and this is where we're going with this in a moment, begin to increase, and I call it the war for the fulfillment of prophecy. Let me explain something to you so you'll understand why the war over prophecy is so big. Because God cannot lie. The Bible said there are two immutable facts, and one of those is God who cannot lie. If Satan, a fallen angel, could ever catch God in breaking his covenant or in a lie of which he promised something and he refused to do it, then it says it this way, when God made a covenant with Abraham, God could swear by no hire, so he swore by himself. A rabbinical source told me one time that for God to tell Abraham... I'm going to give you a son and a nation, and I swear by myself because there's no higher than me. This is what it meant. It meant that God was saying, I will destroy my throne in heaven if I lie to you. Now, that might explain why, why Abraham could take Isaac and put him on an altar and hold a dagger up as though he were taking his life and have wood ready to burn him on a fire because the book of Romans said he counted God able to raise him from the dead. Why would a man even think that he could do that and get his son back? Because God swore an oath by himself by no higher name than his own name. So he knew God had to raise him up if he ever died because nations can't come from a dead boy is everybody seeing what i'm saying cosmic activity will increase and the clash between demons and angels will increase in what i call spirit wars say that with me spirit wars there are three messages that satan hates number one is the preaching of the cross number two is the preaching of the baptism of the holy spirit and number three are prophetic messages. The reason that he hates the preaching of the cross is the preaching of the cross always reminds him of his defeat. Because the blood of Jesus, of which we overcome with, is connected to the crucifixion resurrection of Jesus. Why does he hate the message of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit in you reveals the strategies of the devil before he can ever pull them off. So that's God's secret agent is the Spirit of God who can invisibly step in and hear conversations about people talking about you, hey, that you don't know, and then expose them when the time is necessary. Number three is the prophetic message. I'm going to tell you one reason I believe Satan hates the prophetic message. Ready? Because when it's, when he, every time he hears one preached, it's reminding him his time's running out. Think about that. Just think about it. Every time it's preached, it's a reminder. God's got a clock on your wrist, and it's going tick-tock, tick-tock, ticking down on you. So these are three messages that Satan hates. So here's the thing. I honestly believe, let's talk about people, that people can get so deceived that they believe their own lie. They literally, and I've seen it, can tell a lie and in, they know it's a lie, but they convince themselves it's the truth. I believe the enemy, who is the father of lies and father of deception, I think what I'm about to tell you is possible. Maybe not probable, but possible. <laughs> I believe that he thinks that maybe somehow in the end, he can pull off an upset. Like that horse did, who we talked about. That maybe at the last minute, there's something that he can do. There's something that he can reach out to that can pull up an upset and alter the outcome of the prophecies that have been spoken about him and the dark kingdom. Now, you and I know it's never going to happen. But can people be deceived to believe lies? Yes. Could, this, could Satan and demonic powers believe a lie? Well, look, fallen angels believed a lie. Satan said, I will exalt myself above the throne of God. I will set in the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. And a third of the angels believed him. How do I know that? Because the Bible says when he's cast out of heaven, one-third of the angels fell with him. 
So someone that powerful that can deceive one third of the angels can deceive them into believing. Hang on, boys. Hang on, boys. We're going to pull an upset out of this thing. We're not going to end up in the abyss. We're not going to end up in the pit. We're going to stretch this out. We're going to stretch our time out. How would you stretch your time out? Watch this now. By delaying the fulfillment of the prophecy. Let me say it again. How do you stretch your time out if you're him? By trying to stop or delay. So the greatest prophecy is the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. As a witness unto all nations. And then the end would come. Would you agree with me that that's the one prophecy the church has to fulfill? There are no other actually. Is we have to get the gospel out and then the end comes. So what do you do if you're the enemy? Here we go. You either hinder the gospel or you hinder the people preaching it. Because by thinking you can hinder the gospel and by thinking you can hinder the people preaching it, you delay or stretch out the possibility of the nations being reached and then the end coming. Is anybody tracking with me? I'm talking about the playbook of the enemy during prophetic seasons. How do you stop the message? Consider the following three points. Number one, you can stop the message by preventing Bibles that people can read from entering their nation. This happened under communism in places like Russia in the past. It's happening today in places like China where Bibles are not permitted to be sent out to the public. So there are countries where when it comes to Bibles themselves, there's a hindrance of stopping the word from coming in. Number two, you make Christian gatherings illegal. There is a nation that has over 1 billion people. I'll not name it because this is being taped. But there's a nation with over 1 billion people that several years ago, you used to be able to get a permit to have an outdoor meeting. T.L. Osborne went to this nation when almost no one had ever heard the gospel and had the largest crowds in history. And there are people to this day, and I've had men who are missionaries to tell me this, that there are people to this day that have a T.L. Osborne book that's 60 years old that's falling apart that they got in a crusade and got one to the Lord when Osborne came 60 years ago. Think about that for a moment. So how do you stop it? You try to stop the gatherings. There's one nation that has a billion, over a billion people. Another nation that has over a billion people. There's Islamic nations that have hundreds of thousands of people. So stop a Christian gathering where the gospel cannot be preached. And thus you have helped stop the message of the preaching of the gospel. And the third level, and folks, you've got to hear this because at the end, I'll share without naming things a very interesting story with you, is to attack either the churches or to attack the leadership in the churches to try to either shut the church down or shut down the minister from being able to preach the message that they are preaching. There have been more death of ministers, physical death of ministers, the past three years with the virus than there has been in the history of the church, to my knowledge. I'm talking about in history. One state up north had 360 preachers die. And most of them was the effects of COVID. The church of God alone has had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ministers, including in this town, four of their top leaders that passed away with the COVID virus. So if we look at these things, there's not only ministers' deaths, there's very weird warfare, there is personal attacks, there is liable and slanderous things being said. So why would the enemy be so concerned about the prophetic events taking place because prophetic events indicate his time is running out. So here's something else that I want to share with you. The prophetic message is very significant and will be more significant in the time ahead than it ever has been. In 1991 or 92, now pro Charlie could probably tell me the year, the day, the time, the hour, and when the plane arrived. He just, he just remembers things. But I was invited to go to something called the International Prophetic Conference, which was a conference of some of the, the, not some of, the most leading prophetic ministers in the entire United States. During that conference, now if you guys think that we have a prophetic summit and we do a lot of preaching, 12 services in, what, three and a half days, at the International Prophetic Summit, in four days, they went from 7 o'clock till 9 o'clock nonstop. 
you got a break for lunch, and that was it. I remember days in which one hour, a break to the bathroom, one hour, a break to the bathroom, one hour, a break to the bathroom. And they had, at one time, 22 preachers preaching that event. Now, you talk about a main event. <laughs> you got that many prophetic preachers. So I was invited as the new kid on the block. Now, I remember, and I'm not a name dropper, but over there is Jack Van Impey, and over there is Grant Jeffrey, and over there is uh, Brother Allen. I don't know if you remember him or not. And then I could, oh, my goodness. And over there is George Walverwood, who is the scholar among scholars. And then over there is Ray Brubaker, and over there is, here's another one, and J.R. Church. And, I mean, everybody who was anybody who knew anything about the Bible prophecy was invited to these conferences. Now, listen to what I just said. 22 ministers. As of right now, men that focus on prophecy, there's only five left in the world. Now, I don't mean people who occasionally preach it. And I don't mean ministers that have written a book about it. I'm talking about men who totally, completely focus on it. Now, Jimmy Evans pastored a huge church in Texas. And Jimmy is associated with the great church in Dallas. But Jimmy, if you know him... Everything was marriage, marriage, marriage. But he said that years ago, God spoke to him that he was to study Bible prophecy. Remember, Joni told us this. He was supposed to study Bible prophecy. And now, because of the times we're in, see, God raised, has raised him up to focus entirely on this. So what does God do when there's a shortage of voices? He's going to raise them up. See, God's not going to let everybody pass without filling in the gap. Isn't that a wonderful thing? So here's the reason prophecy is important. Number one, Bible prophecy proves that Jesus was the Messiah. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, Revelation 19.10. And so if you look at this, there's over 324 Old Testament predictions that you can tie in beginning with John the Baptist till the ascension of Jesus that deal with the coming of the return of the Lord. Uh, uh, the, first, the first appearance, there's prophecies, but the second appearance, you've got Zechariah, the king will rule in, in Jerusalem. You've got when the Lord builds up Zion, then he will appear in his glory. So think about that. It proves he was the Messiah, and it proves if he came the first time, he's going to come the second time. The second thing you need to know is prophecy reveals the times and seasons that we're in. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 1, Paul wrote and said, of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord is coming as a thief in the night. Now, the third thing is this, prophecy proves that we're living in the time of the end or we're living in the last days. It is a fact whether people want to Believe what I'm about to say or not, it's just a fact. Jesus Christ could have never returned to this planet until Israel was first a nation again. Secondly, he could have never returned until Jerusalem was in the hands of the Jews. And third, if you read the Bible, one of the great signs of the last days is the Jewish people returning back to their land. So all of this has happened in our generation. You know, you need to give the Lord a hand if your hands are free to thank God that we, we get to be alive. Isn't that amazing? I mean, now think about it. We get to be alive to see what the prophets saw only in visions. <laughs> That's exciting. I don't know about you. The point I want to make is this, that Satan knows his time is running short because of the fulfillment of the prophecies in the Scripture. Now, during major movements, during major prophetic movements, prophetic cycles, fulfillment of God getting ready to do something either in the nation such as Israel or on the global scene, Satan himself will get involved. Now, I will preach at the International Summit probably on Saturday a message that I'm holding off. I'm not preaching it anywhere else, anywhere else except there in June. And I'm going to save a lot of stuff that I could tell you today for then because I'm still getting revelation on it. Four places in the... First of all, the word Satan shows... The name shows up about 55 times, 55 references in the Bible. And we're talking about when it says Satan, it's Satan, the fallen angel. I want you to listen to him and go through this quickly to four places where he shows up. In 1 Chronicles 21 and 1, and Satan stood up to provoke David to number the tribes of Israel, the men in the tribes. Second reference, Job chapter 1 and 2. Fifteen times he's mentioned. He accuses Job 
before God and request that a hedge is lifted so he can attack Job to try to destroy his integrity. Second, second reference. Number three, Zechariah 3, 1 through 3. Satan shows up at the temple to resist the high priest who is offering the brand new sacrifices on the altar after the Jews have been in captivity for 70 years. Number four, Matthew chapter 4, 1 through 8. Another example is in the wilderness where Jesus is being tempted for 40 days. He, Satan himself, shows up in a face-to-face -face encounter. So if you look at what he's doing, he is provoking, accusing, tempting, and trying to stop the progress of God's people. What were the seasons? Said this way. Why did Satan choose to show up in these four places? Boy, I wish I had time to preach this. I don't. Provoking David was important because do you know what happened a few verses before that chapter? David and his men took on and wiped out the last of the giants that had been on earth for 3,000 years approximately. Actually, about, about 2,500 years, the record. So the seed of the serpent, Genesis 3.15, were the giants. And David and his men took them all out. And Satan had lost one of his big weapons. Now he's angry because David has taken out his seed. Are you listening, somebody? The second example, Job chapter 1 and 2. Job is called the greatest man of the East. And if you'll read the Bible, Job, all 42 chapters, the attack was about one thing. Destroy a man who had influence. Job had influence with everybody around him. Probably because he was a wealthy man. He was very respected because of what he had. But nonetheless, read it. It was to try to attack his integrity. And I tell you, it's real funny. And watch me now. When you're up on the mountain... You got a lot of friends. You get, you know, you have the big conferences and they, they, they want to be your friend because they want a front row seat. Oh, did I say that? <laughs> but you'll find out who your friends are when they're crucifying you. You will find out that when you're being crucified, some of those people that hung with you because they wanted to be around the crowds, they don't show up anymore. You're going to find out who's at the cross is mama because Mary's at the cross because that's her boy being hung there. So mama's going to stand with you and you're going to have one friend named John who's going to stand with you because all the rest of them left and are hiding. Is anybody listening now? If you have not learned that, do not be disappointed when you do. <laughs> Zechariah 3, 1 through 3. Why does Satan show up? What does Satan care that a priest is at an altar offering sacrifices? you got to go back to what he's doing. Once the sacrifices are put on the altar for the first time, it sanctifies all the property again to prepare for the future of what God will do there. It's about the blood. It was an attack on the blood offerings. Stop the blood offerings. Because Satan, when he attacked Job, do you know the first thing that happens when Job gets attacked? Read in Job 1. The, the thieves come and steal the animals and lightning kills 7,000 sheep. You could have put a sheep or a, a lamb or a ram on an offering for a sacrifice. And Job chapter 1 and 5, it says he sacrificed continually lest his kids curse God. And what does Satan take the first thing? Anything with blood. That's why Job was unable to put a hedge back up to protect himself because there was no blood. You go to chapter 42, guess what shows up when the hedge comes back? They, they brought seven animals, the, the friends did, and stuck them on the altar, sacrificed the animals, the blood flowed again, and the hedge came back up. <laughs> Satan understands the power of the blood of Christ. And the confession of the power of the blood. Why did they, why did he show up to attack Jesus? You read the attack on Jesus. If you're the son of God, if you're the son of God, if you're the son of God, he's trying to make him question who he is. Believe this or not, when the enemy tries to make you question God's love for you and does he really care and are you really important, that's the enemy trying to attack your identity as a son and daughter. Preach on, I'm going to. Mm. The end time strategy is divided into four D's. And this is the playbook. Now listen to it carefully. Division, 
distraction, disruption, and delusion. <laughs> Division is interesting because if you ever know a, about a community, for example, in this town, the North Cleveland Church of God is like the mother church. It's 110 years old now, I think. Not the building, but the congregation goes back that far. But do you know how many Church of Gods are actually in Cleveland? The last count I had was, was about 8 to 10 in this town. Because guess what happens? They all split off each other. No, they all believe the same. They preach the same thing, got the same doctrine, same declaration of faith. But you know, eventually somebody says, I just don't like it here. Let's go start a church. And they go start one. And that's, uh, you know, someone started one a while back, and I thought to myself, yeah, that's all we need 361 churches. Because <laughs> I've heard there's 360. It's all we need one more. Praise God. So, you know, you, you, uh, and I shouldn't say it this way because some churches are started because ministers want to start a campus. We know that. And they want to expand it. And that's true, especially today. But you got people that they start them just because they got mad. The last thing I want to do in my lifetime is waste time sitting in a place with a bunch of disgruntled people who all they do is complain about what happened. <laughs> hey, anybody got time for that? It's a YouTube video, by the way. Pretty old on that one. <laughs> but division, and the reason that division is powerful is because division disrupts the unity, and the unity is where the, where the power is. Number two, distraction. There is attract, and there is distract. Attack means taking a liking or interest in something in a favorable opportunity, or a favorable opportunity. Attraction. Distraction means to distract is throw off the track to divert attention from something important. What a distraction does is it throws off your focus because when you're distracted, you cannot focus on what you're supposed to be focusing on. Number three is disruption. In Nehemiah and Ezra's day, when they were rebuilding the walls, there were three men that showed up. And they started just harassing them verbally and threatening them verbally. And this is so funny. If you've never heard me talk about this, but Nehemiah is told by one of them, Hey, when to have a meeting? Come down off the wall and let's go. And this is the name of the place. Let's go to the plains of Ono. It's spelt like it sounds. O-N-O. O-N-O. So let's go. So Nehemiah says, no, I'm not leaving what I'm doing to have a meeting with a bunch of disgruntled people who disagree with what I'm doing. And that's what he told them. So you know what the plains of, you know, Jerusalem's 2,500 feet in elevation. The plains of Omno is a valley. When you're on the wall, you're up, baby. You're up. You might be working and fighting with a sword with one hand and a trowel and the other, but you're up. But when you get to the plains of, oh, no, you know what happens. You go have that meeting with those people, and you walk up and say, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. Oh, no. That's why it's the plains of, oh, no. Because when you get there, you're going to say, oh, no, what am I doing down here? Preach, Perry. Yes, I will. <laughs> so dis disruption is a distraction. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. There's distraction. Then there's disruption. To interrupt means to disturb or halt an ongoing process by suddenly interfering with it. If someone jumps up and interrupts you. Someone, you're driving, they pull out in front of you, they interrupt your flow. To disrupt is to throw the process into confusion or to throw it into disorder. And the fourth element, and I'm going to say something. I have made, for the past couple of years, I've made jokes about this, but it's actually serious. But I said somebody... Somebody put something in the Cleveland water supply. And I'm going to tell you a fact that I just found out from somebody in the medical field. They were in Nashville. Somebody in Nashville told us this. They said <laughs> in a study of, of mentally challenged people in Tennessee, <laughs> Cleveland has the highest level of the whole state. Do you remember? I don't know who told us that. Somebody. So here's the thing. And I said, what do you mean? They said there's more people in Cleveland that have to go to mental hospitals, Bradley County area, than any county in the entire state. And I said, I know a couple that need to go. Can you, can you, can you open up something? 
Because honestly, I've never seen, and let me tell you what it is. It's it, delusion. It, there's a word there that says delusion, but there's another word called dilute. Diluting something down. So to a person who is in delusion, they are following an illusion and calling it fact. I'm going to give you a quote. Delusions are fixed false beliefs that conflict with reality. A person in a delusional state cannot let go. Delusions are often reinforced by a misrepresentation of events. Many delusions also involve some level of paranoia. Delusions are a part of psychotic disorders with hallucinations involving something that really isn't there. Now, I will not go into people that I have known that are delusional. Maybe one day I'll have permission to tell my stories. Not today or not anytime soon. <laughs> but I have met people who become so delusioned in an imagination that they eventually convince themselves. And I'm going to tell you, they're so good at it, they can convince you that this happened or that was said or that was done and it can be based on a delusion. And it is something that I call, this is my phrase, delusional paranoia. Throwing out things to gaslight to get a reaction. Boy, I wish I could tell you something. In my lifetime, I have seen attacks that were pure demonic. At age 18, for six months, during a time of just fasting day after day, month after month, I don't mean I fasted the whole month, but I'm saying it was continual fasting and praying, I actually heard and saw, and I mean literal, not a dream, demonic spirits with hoods attacking me and cursing me. Literally, as I'm talking to you audibly, it happened that I, at that level, age, age 18. In Danville, Virginia, in the month of November, I saw them come through a window. I actually had to sleep with a light on, not a big light, but a, I'd always make sure I had a little light. I could not sleep without a light on because once, once the darkness hit, they would show up. But I saw them come into a window, a short one and a tall one. One was very tall, one was half that size, and they stood at the foot of the bed with hoods on. You could not see their faces. And finally, God delivered me from those uh, manifestations after six straight months. On October of 81, three years later, I was 21 years of age, and I was, and I've told this before, but let me tell it very quickly. I was in a church in Virginia having a great revival. It was the most awesome revival. I did not know this till years later that they could not find enough kids to sell drugs in three counties because the kids were getting saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Hundreds. And that's a fact. A former drug dealer told me that, who's now saved. Um, the men who were doing drugs, um, let me say it, let me go back. Not doing, but heading the system, the soldiers. They got together in Radford, Virginia, and had a meeting. And I found this out. Pam knows what I'm talking about. It's true, because this was exposed to us 10 years later. And said, how do we stop him? And one of the guys said, you shoot him. They said, no, no, that's too, that's too much. We're not going to do that. We're not going to go shoot some kid. So they sent a man. Now, you got to remember, I did not know this. They sent a man to the pastor to tell stories on me that weren't true. And I start hearing stuff, and I'm saying, who's starting this and where it's coming from? But let me tell you what I did see the third, going into the third week of that revival. I was awakened in an evangelist department, and so help me unless God helps me that I have to do it. I will never stay in an evangelist department in a church as long as I live. And my wife knows it. If you're going to tell me I'm going to come to your church and stay in the apartment in the church, I'm going to say, nope, no, I'll go 30 miles down the road and stay in the closest hotel you got, but you're not putting me in a haunted of our apartment. 
you try staying in one. You won't understand it till you stay in one. You hear every creak and sound and voices. I mean, think you're going nuts after a couple of weeks. So here's what happened. I want to share this with you. I am lying in bed in this advanced department. There was no cell phones back then. This was 1981. There was no, uh, there wasn't even a television. There was not even a phone in the room, if you can believe that. Okay. The bathroom light was on. And I could go from the door here in the bedroom, across the hall, into the bathroom, in case I had to get up. I hear the door of the outside, back of the church where I'm at, somebody at the door at 3 in the morning. How do I know it was 3? Because I had a, a slip with a watch on that had that little digital glow-in-the-dark hand, the old, old kind. God, what in the world? So I'm thinking, who's coming in? And I thought, uh-oh, something's happened, and the pastor's coming to tell me. So I kind of adjusted myself, had my pajamas on, adjusted myself, waiting to see what was going to happen. They came in the building. And it's like my hearing was magnified. I could hear this. They went to the place which was about five feet away on my left in a hallway where the janitor kept the, uh, the vacuum cleaner and things to clean the church. And I heard that door open. And I thought, oh, my Lord, surely they're not here going to clean the church. <laughs> Please, Lord, I, I'm trying to sleep. That's what I'm thinking this. Then I hear them jiggling the door of my apartment, and I'm thinking, well, they could at least knock, and they came in. And I, by this time, I'm kind of freaking out, thinking, well, the only person that has the keys is the janitor or the pastor. And I'm thinking, this must be really serious for them not to knock. But when I looked, I was not asleep. I saw a four-foot, he looked like about four-foot tall, being that looked like it had the wrappings of an Egyptian mummy with red eyes and gnarled teeth carrying two garbage bags. And it walked right past the door. I could see it through the light. I'm thinking, dear God, what am I looking at? And I'm fully awake. I hear the apartment is being ransacked by this spirit. Now, secular people call it a poltergeist spirit. I don't, I, I don't know what you would call this one. I just know what I saw. When it was done, it did not have the garbage bags, but it came walking past through. And I remember lying there and being unable to move like I was froze hearing it and I cut my eyes and I had the blankets to be on my sheet up pretty close to by the way <laughs> but I cut my eyes to the left and it leaned in and it eh, made a noise and gnarled with those teeth and I'm telling you it you know you can say oh I tell you what just plead the blood of Jesus brother you can't plead nothing when you see something like that I'm just going to tell you now if it ever happens to you you'll understand because fear fear overtakes you yeah, I know I'm saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, but I'm seeing something in the spirit that a human being shouldn't even be seeing. It goes into the pastor's office, unlocks its door, gets in the door somehow. I could hear it. Goes through file cabinets. Then I can hear it. Every sound is magnified going up the steps to the pastor's council room, and it never left. I never heard it leave. And I finally managed to pray myself back to sleep. Ten years later, ten years later, I am with a boy. And I'm not going to go into the whole story. It would take too long, but he was almost killed in a wreck. I went to pray for him. God raised him, off of his, raised him out of a bed in a hospital. And I ran out because I knew the doctors were going to run me out after him shaking all over the bed and had a cast on. Get let me out of here. I said, I'm out of here, son. I'll see you. He shows, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm in trouble praying for this kid. He's going to jump out of bed. He just got here from a car wreck. And the next night, he, the next day, he's in church. And he, Pam was sitting with me with B. Ogle, Alex and Kathy Wolf, and several others. He said this to me. He said, I've got to tell you something happened. He said, do you remember in 1981, the big revival? I said, sure, I do, four and a half weeks. He said, you know, my whole family got saved. I got saved in that revival. He said, yep, I don't know. He said, but you know that they... They lied. They told a lot of lies on you, and there was a lot of confusion in the church. They said I was going to start a church, that I hit the pastor. I was going to split the church and move up there for a church. All I was going to do was move back to Virginia, which was not, not the right place to go, and that's how I ended up in Tennessee. So all kinds of crazy stories got out there. I said, I said brother, do I remember I counted seven things that were said about me, and not one of them was true. Not one. Not one. He said, well, you don't know the inside that I know. He said, I got so mad at the church, I backslid and went all the way against God and church and everybody else. And he said, I got involved with the occult and with drug dealers. And he said, let me tell you what happened. He said, I'm going to tell you what you saw. He said, first, let me tell you what happened. The, the, one, of the, one of the illegitimate children of Anton LaVey was at the university recruiting people for the occult. And they were going to stop your revival one way or the other. They were involved with the drug movement as well. And he came to the church 
while you were having church and walked that back hallway and they were told that your apartment was there and put a demon inside that church. I said, I said, are you serious? He said, bro, I was involved with them. And he said, I'm going to tell you what the demon looked like. Exactly four foot tall, looked like an Egyptian mummy with red eyes and gnarled teeth. And I about fell out of my seat. I'm telling you, there wasn't really anybody that knew this. Pam did. And I looked at Pam. Do you remember, baby? I said, oh, my God, are you kidding? He said, no. And then he proceeded to tell me some things he had seen. And to show you that this guy knew what he was talking about, guess who visited me about either the next day or two days later, a detective from another county that wanted to know about a murder that took place. Because he said, I know you've talked with the kid. And I looked at that guy. I said, let me tell you something, sir. I also know about the occult being involved in the police department around here. And I said, let me tell you something. How do I know you're not part of it? And so help me if that guy didn't start doing this. And I scared him so bad with what I told him. He, I got out of his car and he drove off and I never saw him again. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> so, so that particular spirit was sent by a occult group. And the only way it did damage is by whispering in people who listened to it. I think I'll let that soak in. At age 32 in Romania, Charlie was with me on this trip, I believe. Two women in two different churches, and they spoke Romanian, so they used an interpreter, gave me a warning that I had shaken up a principality, and they implied it was a Romanian principality by coming and exposing them. I literally went to these huge churches with thousands of people and preached on Ephesians 6, how to bring down a prince spirit. And she said, you've attacked them and shaken them so bad that God said to warn you, they're coming after you. And I go to another town hours away and another woman comes up to my interpreter and gives me the same word. And I say to God, can I not get a good prophetic word? <laughs> I mean, everywhere I go, it's be careful, the devil's after you. Be careful, the enemy hates you. Be careful, be careful, be careful. Can somebody say, thus saith the Lord, I'm going to prosper you. I, I, I'm going to bless you coming in, bless you going out, make you the head not. Can I? Everybody else gets a prosperity word but me. Then a year later, I went to pray for a man in this town that the enemy had attacked him. He's now with the Lord, but he was a great preacher. People in this room would know his name. He asked me to come and pray for him, and a demonic spirit overtook him. And that demonic spirit spoke through him and said, I'm coming after you when you turn 33 years of age, and I'm taking you out. And I got mad, and I picked him up off his couch and... Th Pinned him against the wall. I was a skinny boy myself back then. And he was, I started rebuking the devil. And by the way, I rebuked the devil and I said, you go get help. And he went and got help, got off of drugs, got off alcohol, and became a leader to help other men get off. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. So I, don't, I want to tell a good side. And one year later, I, I, I came under the darkest, and Pam will remember this, the darkest depression and I could not pull myself out of that depression if my life depended on it. And I forgot about the prophecy from the Romanian women. And when it all started coming back to me, I had intercessors begin to pray to break that. And I can remember when it broke. I'm going to say one thing, and I will not give you the details. I had trouble start in this town in November of 2019 at a party where a man told a complete lie on me and a man working for me believed it. And I've had hell and that man, I threatened to sue him and he moved and hadn't been back in this town. So I have dealt with spirits working through people. Preach on. Somebody say preach on. So I've asked my friends about some things over the years. Two of my very close friends 
actually, Brother Lowry would have been one I would have gone to, and my dad would have been one I would have gone to, but they're with the Lord. So some of my real strong prophetic men are with Jesus. But I have some great friends named Floyd Lahan, Tony Scott, and these are very mature, John Kilpatrick, Randy Felshaw, I don't want to keep name dropping, Jim Baker, some men that I really love these guys very much. And some of these men have been through their own levels of attacks, either with physical, physical problems or people, or just it could be a number of things. The majority of them has said the same thing to me. When I tell them the stories or they know, Lahan knows all of these stories. Lahan was the evangelism director when I was 18 and my mother was his secretary when the demon spirits were showing up. You know what Lahan's word to me was? Perry, quit concentrating on the devil. Concentrate on Jesus. Because if you pray, oh Jesus, he'll show up. Holy Ghost, in the name of Jesus. That's what he told me. We've, we've learned over the years to talk like these guys, in case you haven't figured that out yet, you know. And, uh, and uh, so the men have shared with me over the years of battle. We're talking years. Because Tony knew me when I was 18. I still preach for Tony. And they said this, and I want to make this clear. Then this message is not about me, but it's about why the attacks increase. It, man, I feel the Holy Ghost like real heavy. <laughs> Jesus. Why the seasons are so weird right now. Tony said the problem that you're dealing with is the abundance of the revelation. Floyd said, the problem is the abundance. And I said, you're going to have to explain. He said, do you remember Paul said, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to slow me down or buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure because of the abundance of the revelation. And I'm not saying this boasting. God knows, and I hope nobody takes it that way, but I understood what they were saying. God gives me visions about things that's going to happen. He gives me prophetic insight that most people do not get, and I'm the guy that will preach what other people avoid. And that's the truth. And he said this. He said, Satan hates the revelation because the revelation opens up the eyes of the people. So the attack mm, is threefold. Number one, the strategy of creating an offense. And let me tell you something. You can offend people, but people can offend you. And you've got to deal with their, you, the offense you feel by what they did that you're trying to correct, right? The strategy of accusation. The strategy of wearing down the saints. Daniel chapter 7 verse 25. Because here's what Satan fears the most. I really believe what I'm about to say. Now I'm talking about our time. There's been different things he has observed through history. There have been different seasons that God has moved through history. But there's something that he fears. And I'm going to tell you what it is. The final outpouring that's going to strike this world like a whirlwind. That's what he fears. I'm, I'm almost done with this part. But For some reason, I want to tell you a dream, and I want to relate it especially for those of you who are here. Many of you know why we built a big building of 72,000 square feet in Cleveland, Tennessee called Omega Center International. But if you've not heard the story, it traces back to a young man a little over 30 years of age sitting in a room back there taping his dad right now. The enemy tried to kill my son with drugs and alcohol and came that close to succeeding when we were with him in a hospital in an emergency room. And I told Satan, you're going to pay. I said, you're going to pay. I don't know how you're going to pay, but you're going to pay for touching my boy. And the Lord gave me the revelation to build this place for a generation. Omega Center International, 
at first was never intended to be a church, was it? Never. But you know what happened? People started moving here with their kids. Hello. And then people started retiring like you. Got saved in my ministry when I was 18. They started saying, let's just go to Cleveland. And next thing you know, we got so many people and don't know what to do with them. We said, we might as well just start a Tuesday. And we started the Tuesday night service and the rest is history. But it originally was built for a younger generation to have conferences and meetings and our prophetic summit, our main event. It was built for that, but it has emerged into a weekly gathering place. It's emerged, as you know, into a weekly world prayer meeting. So all of this has been a plan from the Lord. So when the first Warrior Fest happened, and Karen Wheaton said, you can expect probably 500. If you've never done it, I said, dear Lord, I've built this huge building, and I'm going to have 500 kids in it. Jesus, help me. And 4,000 showed up. <laughs> you remember that? Anybody remember that? <laughs> in the next conference, 5,000 showed up. And somebody said, you better have two. Then we started splitting up and having two. Of course, COVID messed all that up. You know, we had, we had to change a little bit of that. But... Uh, I remember looking at people and saying these words. If you even think, Dean, you'll, I know you'll remember this because you've been with us a long time. If you think Satan's going to sit back and let us reach these young people without a war, you got nothing coming. And, you know, 500 people, Woo come on, amen, preach it, brother. And then, we're, we're, you know, 250 of them aren't there now. Yeah. Now, they, they blame it on me. That's fine. Blame it on who you want to. But I'm saying they, they listened, but they didn't listen. They heard, but they didn't really hear. Jesus said to his disciples, take heed to how you hear and what you hear. And he kept saying, again, I say. So what happens is when, when these level of attacks come, instead of discerning what it is, saying we need to have a prayer meeting. Shut our mouth and have a prayer meeting. People do I think, I think, I think, I think, I heard, I heard. Did you hear? Okay. That's what happens. And it happens everywhere. Preach, Perry. Yes, it does. It happens everywhere. So, I had a dream, and I'm going to tell you this dream. I'm going to relate it back to what I told you just now to prove the point. In October of 2021, I was in Owensboro, Kentucky. I was staying at a hotel downtown getting ready to preach for a wonderful pastor and church there in Kentucky. Never been there before. Charlie was in another room. I'm in this room. Very nice room. Overlooks the river. I'd been up a while, went to bed, but I woke up. And I woke up and I said, boy, it's too early to get up. I just can't get up four hours before I preach. So let me go back and let in. Right when I laid back down, I went into a dream. And it was spiritual. It's as, it's as real right now. And I'm going to tell you a part of it I did not share publicly before. In the month of October in Owensboro, Kentucky, I went into a dream of which I was at a lake. It was not a massive lake, but it was a good-sized lake, and it was covered by ice, which made me think of winter. Now, that could have another meaning, but, I mean, it was, we were headed toward winter. And there's a boat, very nice boat, not large, but like a fishing boat that you would use on a lake. There was an old man, very distinguished, very tanned, Rather wrinkled in the face, but he was older. He was like a, he would remind you of an elder in a congregation, 70, 75 years of age. And I got on the boat with some young preachers. Nick Walker was on that boat. Now, you do know Nick has moved his, you know, offices here to Cleveland. So that hadn't happened yet. And Nick is with, with me. And I hear the captain say, okay, we're going after the young fish. We're going after the little fish. He gave me a net. He gave Nick, Nick a net. So we all had a net. And the net had a long, beautiful silver pole. It was square. Now, it reminded me of a pool net. It was square. And it was just, it wasn't big. But it was like to scoop them up. You were to gun into. So I remember that we broke through some ice. And I could see just these little fish. And they're just going. And I went down expecting to pick them up. And I came up with zero. And I said to the captain, somebody is trying to scare these fish away from us. And I turned from my right side to my left 
And I saw six or seven of the ugliest fish I've ever seen in my life. They were twice the size of this. They were shaped very odd. Like, they weren't shaped like a normal fish. They were very wide and went up into the, their... And they were all lined up. They were in alignment together, side by side. But I remember the skin. You know, I say the skin. Picture, let's say, a catfish. Then picture a rockfish. Does anybody know what a rockfish looks like? They're ugly. They look like... The, the, instead of just normal scales, they just got... And I saw these fish. They had bumps... Believe it or not, some of them had tattoos. Tattoos, bumps. I'm not saying tattoos are ugly, you know, but I'm just saying that that's what they look like. One of them did, at least. But, I mean, and, 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 but they, you know, a, ta- a fish don't wear tattoos. You understand? These were human beings represented by fish. But, I mean, they had human lips, just like human lips, and they had human eyes. And I said, those people are running their mouth to stop the fish from getting in my net. What do I do? And the captain said... Take your net and beat him in the head as hard as you can. And I took that net, and by that time, what was weird, I'm now underwater looking at him. And I went to the first one, bam, and I hit him, bam, 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 and I'm hitting him. And you know what they're doing? They're going, mm. they're not moving. Didn't do one thing, just an old bunch of belligerent fish, not gonna do a thing. But something happened. To that fish on the left side. And I want to be careful telling this, but I want to tell it exactly the way it happened. I took that thing, and when I hit that fish, it rolled over on its back as though it died. I went, I went what? That one just rolled over. And a female fish, this is a male fish that's rolled over, comes out of the corner, there was a big post and comes up and takes that fish's tail in its mouth and starts shaking it and that fish ain't moving. Then as they keep trying to revive this fish, this female fish somehow goes backwards as though to go away from the others with the male fish, the tail of the male fish in its mouth and when it did, all those ugly mean fish Went back three feet. When I looked, I suddenly saw that scene disappear. And under the water, this is the part I've never told publicly. I've only told this one time. But under the water on the left side was a slab that almost looked marbleish. I thought at first it was a door, but it was a slab. And there was another fish hanging upside down by its tail on a gold hook. I was saying, whoa. And then I stopped and screamed, let's get back to fishing. And when I turned, I scooped that net and the fish started jumping back. I I think I know what that means and I'll not self-interpret it to you. But I want to make my point here in a moment. (laughs) Give me just a second because I want to see which way the Holy Spirit wants me to share this with you. Uh, Jason Armstrong is a dream interpreter. And I said, Jason, I'm going to tell you this dream and you tell me what it means. And I got to the fish. Now watch just... I would never think this, hanging upside down. You know, when you catch a fish, you catch it by how? These were being caught by their tails. And Jason said, oh, brother, it's not their tails. It's their T-A-L-E-S. It's the tails they're saying. I'll leave that alone. And this is the point I want to make with telling you that dream in October. The enemy wants to hinder the final generation of sons and daughters. Your kids and your grandkids 
from coming into the move of God. But I got news for you. Satan has never yet been able to stop a prophecy from God. You better praise him. Uh, uh, no, no, no. You better. Uh, I said you better praise him. Hey, hey. Glory to his name. Jesus. Jesus. So see, going back to the dream, and I got one more thing to say, but going back to the dream, just remember, we were being hindered. Me, on a boat, we're being hindered. But I always want to go to the end of the story and tell you the fish came back. Let's use the next illustration, and I'll conclude with this. The incident I told you about a moment ago of which that spirit showed up in that church, I had a dream in the month of August, three months before I ever went to that church. And in the dream, I'm at a lake. <laughs> Folks, this is 1981. I'm at a lake fishing with a pole. I've written about this and told it for years. I cast the pole in and got the biggest fish I ever had in my life. That meeting in 81 was the biggest, greatest meeting I ever had in my life up to that point. And I caught the most beautiful fish. And as I'm reeling it in, it turned into a snake. Remember that, baby? Pam's heard me tell this 10 times at least. I, I went to unhook the fish, and as it turns into a snake, I drop it, and it goes and bites my foot. And I said, oh, my God. And I literally picked it up somehow, maybe even hooked it again, and thrown it back. And as I throw it back, the snake turns into a fish and goes back in the water. And the Lord says, the snake's going to bite you, but it ain't going to kill you. Amen. The reason it bit my foot is the feet is how I carry the gospel. And because of things that people said, and again, nothing true, it hindered me for a season. Pam will remember this. We were so, I was so upset, didn't know how to, I would handle it different. Now, she knows how I would do it now differently, but I didn't know how to handle some of this stuff back then. Didn't know what to do. But here's the part that's always bugged me about that dream after I had it. And all this happened. I said, that's that dream about that lake. That's that, this is the snake. And it's bit me. And the Lord says, but do you remember when it turned back into a fish? Guess what happened? A few years later, I go back to that same church. And have another five-week revival. And I go back to that same church. And years later, I have a three-week revival. And guess what happened? I got the fish back. Are you tracking with me? Same church, same place. Got the fish back. You have to understand something. And I know you do. I'm preaching to the choir here. But you have to understand, this is real warfare we're in. So there's three things I want you to do. I want you to say, play, and pray. <laughs> you say, what is that? Everybody say, say, say. Play, play, pray. pray. I want you to say the scripture continually. Verses that God gives you when you get up, something that he's given you over the years, start saying it. Say it just like Jesus quoting scripture to Satan. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's in Deuteronomy. He didn't make that up. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shall you serve. That's in Deuteronomy. Jesus quoted three scriptures from the book of Deuteronomy when Satan, and he didn't quote him in his head. He said them out loud. Start Start saying the word. Just start saying the word. Just drive, drive, drive and get a verse and just say it. I've been doing this a lot lately. Say it. Play it. What does that mean? Play music. Because the Lord spoke to me when I was preparing this and said, you tell the people that to keep their mind renewed, the best way of doing it is playing music. Because as you play music, did you know you cannot sing and say something at the same time? Try it. 
You can't do it. You can't speak in tongues and speak in English at the same time. You have to do one or the other. Or, you know, one time this, one time that. So when you're, when you're listening, and I do, I listen to music all day long on a comu little computer the whole time I'm studying. Now, I'm one of the few people that can have five things going on at once if you've ever talked to anybody who works for me. Most people have to have quiet if they're studying, not me. i got to have noise. A quiet room drives me crazy. So I will study. I write books with music going, and I'll just stop and switch that, stop and switch that. and just. But you know what it does? It keeps your mind focused because when David played the harp, the evil spirit left Saul. So there's power in, there's power in the music, right? Pray it. My dad taught me before he died that there would be end-time attacks of the enemy that would come against the church. And the way you overcome it is, and this is his exact quote, pray excessively in the Holy Ghost. Pray excessively in the Spirit. Now, I watched Jesus. I watched my dad get under a burden, and he would just, he, he'd pray nonstop. He prayed continually. But the, the final thing I want to say to you, and this is for you personally, this is for us, for you, for all of us here. In Job's situation in the book of James, it says, you have seen the end of the Lord and how he's of tender mercy. And you've heard of the patience of Job. We can... We can and it can be done, and it's hard, but you can outlast the storm. Amen. You, you can. And listen, it's tough because I get very impatient sometimes. I got in the flesh before and told the Lord, either you do something about it or I will. <laughs> what did he say? Nothing. He don't answer stupid stuff. You answer that. Where are you at? It's like, I'll talk to you when you calm down. Amen. Who am I talking to in the house? Amen. I'll talk to you when you shut up. <laughs> Two of my very closest friends, and I will not tell the story because this is their story. And no one in this room would even know about these two incidents. But two of my very closest ministry friends who passed from mega churches, two of the greatest churches, I preached there quite a bit, and I love going to these two. They're two of my favorites. Came under the most hellish attack. One was by another minister, and another was by a family in, a, in this guy's church. And when this one man called me in Nashville and began to tell me what had happened, I had never heard it. I didn't know what had happened. I could not believe how demonic a lie was set against him and his wife. It was hellish. And it went on seven years. And he called me to tell me that three judges threw it completely out of court and said it was a group of people that all they wanted was money. And three judges saw through it and threw it completely out of court. My, my other friend had something similar, and he is a, look, he's one of the finest. He's probably the most perfect preacher I've ever been around. I don't, I don't exalt people, but, I mean, he's just great. He's just humble and sincere, and it's a great church, and someone came after him. You know, his solution, and I have several pastors like this, is just fast your way through it. Floyd Lahan said, I've never fought a devil I couldn't pray through. Let me tell you something. If you're not part of the problem and you're not part of the solution, stay out of it. Seriously. This is, this is, this is what I practice. What do you think about so-and-so? It's not my battle. Did you hear about? No, don't care to. I'm not part of the problem and I can't solve it for him. So take it to God. Is this good advice? Is that wisdom for anybody? Just take it to God. Can't do nothing about it. Take it to God. So I want to tell you this. If you are dealing with 
something that you know is not normal. Is anybody just dealing with stuff that's not normal? Can, can, would you raise your hand? Anybody dealing with some really mean people? Have you? Uh, you, you, it's okay. I know they may be in the room, but it's okay. Raise your hand. And, uh, no, they're not in this room. I guarantee you they're not in this room. Uh, I'm going to tell you what I believe, and we're starting to see this in our own ministry. And I can't tell you anything about it. We're starting to see God's help in a great way. But I will tell you this. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost so strong. God lets you go through things for reasons. God never wastes a trial. But he always has the end of it. He, he always has the end of it. My new book titled The Visions contains specific details of visions and revelations involving future, both national and international events from visions and encounters that I have recorded in my private journal. I waited for the right prophetic season to disclose these warnings and events. God's word states that if spiritual watchmen do not warn the people of the danger they see coming, the watchmen will be held accountable for what happens to the people. After experiencing much inner conviction in my soul, I sensed it was the right time to pen what I and others have seen. Much of this book covers warning visions explaining what is coming and how to prepare. I've divided the visions into what was, what is, and what is to come. Here are some of the subjects I will cover in the book. Learn the four different types of spiritual visions. I explain ancient oracles exposing how leaders attempted to see the future. Visions of cities burning both present and future, including New York City. My father's vision of a planned East Coast nuclear attack. Also, my recent visions concerning cremation ovens. I experienced a vision of a frightening assault on a public school that I want to share with you. I have for many years experienced tsunami visions, and I've decided to release that information and include the locations that I have seen in those visions. There is a vision of a nuclear power plant that initiates a stock market crash. There's a vision of empty cities and empty streets that I believe is linked to the recent pandemic and possibly another pandemic coming. The vision of the 10 mile radius bio weapons attack on London, England. And also I've seen in three different visions, a strong earthquake impacting the Midwest, especially the St. Louis area. I also talk about the strange vision of three tornadoes that I believe cost Hillary Clinton her political future. I share a vision revealing future attacks on individual Christians and churches. I also talk about when political leaders and their administrations lose divine favor with God. I have a section where I talk about 2024 and beyond, and I've included what I believe to be an interesting historical parallel about a possible Trump second term, the coming revival through the lens of a camera. One of my favorite chapters that's gonna be very helpful to you is this, 10 rules and wisdom principles for surviving and thriving at the end. The book also has important instructions for the reader to follow. When you order this new book, I'm also including my two audio CD teaching, The Battle of the Two Marks, which exposes the future mark of the beast and explains the mystery of the seal of God, both which are alluded to in the book of Revelation. Get the new book and the audio CD now for your donation of $35 or more. Ask for offer VS 141. You can order at perrystone.org or by calling toll-free 1-888-21-BREAD or mail your order to Perry Stone, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320. I hope every prophetic student, intercessor, and those interested to know what is ahead will take time to order this new spiritual resource. I've written this in the fear of the Lord, but I believe it's now the time to release the messages. A remnant is now waking up and preparing. What about you?